known to most of the world as Plastic Man with a C and not a K. That's right. Yeah. And rather than uh, you know talking about what you do, we thought we'd uh, just kick it off with a tune from yourself. What's this? Um, this is a release I had uh, called Hard Graft, which was, um, I think it came out in 2002, 2003 sort of time. Not that long ago, but uh, I think it was my, I think it was my third release. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to play it for you now anyway. Now, for a lot of people, uh, you know, that sound might, and that whole style of music might be very foreign. For people that don't know, what, what are we calling this? Um, at the moment, people are sort of labelling it as a new genre called grime, which sort of evolved from the old UK garage scene when it started getting a little bit dark. So it's like, but people have labelled it grime. It's like totally new kind of music that's coming out of London at the moment, and it started to spread around. Now, if you if you if you had to describe to your grandmother what grime was all about musically, how would you, how would you tell her? Um, I suppose it's like just like energetic, um, dark, mainly instrumental, because most tracks are made um, with the intention of perhaps. Um, an MC like to spit lyrics over the top of it, or I don't know. It's just like quite high energy, dark stuff, really. So when you say that, you're talk talking more about like you know the, the whole dance hall concept with say rhythm culture and people come out with a rhythm and MCs toast over it, and that's it's that's kind of it. evolved from that. Yeah, totally. It's the same. It's the same concept. Yeah. Right now, I mean, without a doubt, in, in kind of modern electronic music, I don't think there's been any more genre that's been more confusing for people. Like in the last five years, you've You've seen like you've the speed garage thing, then UK garage, then two step, with the had break step, and then there's grime and sublow and esky, and it's all a bit mad, really. Yeah, I mean, what, what's what's the difference, and, and what's up with all these different people calling their stuff um, different things? When I don't know, I just think that it changes so much that everyone's just trying to stick a pin on it and say this is what it's called, and then like someone will go, I don't want to call it that. That's not, I'm not calling my music that. We're going to call it this instead, and it just got so. Right, so confusing for, for everyone that someone just come, has to come along and just go, oh, let's just call it grime, let's do that, and that will do sort of thing. It's got to that point now. Everyone sat there and went, okay, we'll call it grime. Yeah, I think, I don't even know if everyone sort of, it's not even like an official name, it's just like what most people call it now. So like, technically, it's not even the proper name for it, it's just like what a lot of people will call it. And so if someone says to me, I make sublo, just go, no, <laughs> you make grime. Yeah, basically, sublo is like a subdivision of grime, but there's no point trying to pigeonhole it anymore. It's such a small scene that hasn't really reached its uh, full potential yet, so there's no point trying to pigeonhole it even more. So I think if you just stick to grime, it'll be all yes. right. I mean, where, where did the word grime come from, first of all? Um, it basically got when like the whole thing switched from UK Garage and it became quite MC-based and uh, dark. You'd hear like MCs on the mic saying, "Oh, this is this one's grimy," or someone would go, "That tune's grimy," and then it got like DJs were going, oh, "I don't really like grime, this grimy stuff." Like the garage DJs would get on the mic and say, "No, we don't support the grime," and it just stuck. Really, it just took a few people to start using the word. And now, if I was to look up in the dictionary the word "grimy," mm. what, what would I find? Um, dirt. <laughs> dirt. <laughs> dirt. Scum. I don't know. It's, it's like, yeah. I mean, you know what you were saying before. Uh, I don't, I don't think any you know, genres like evolve so much and with all these different names. I mean, what, I, what I think would be cool is uh, for a lot of people, also the word garage you know, conjures up the US images of garage. Yeah, totally. Uh, maybe we can kind of break down the, you know, over the last six or seven years what it's evolved from and kind mm. of the, with some tunes just to give people ideas. Yeah, definitely. I've um, got some um, old garage tracks as well, just so you can see like, the difference, how it's kind of um, changed over the years. Or, like, this old First of all, at what point did UK producers take, you know, because I mean, the, the old US version of House and Garage, you know, when did the, the UK producers start picking up on that and why did they pick up on the name Garage? Um, I'm not too sure, to be honest with you. I think it was just like, at the time, um, it was like when Jungle and um, that was starting to fade out a little bit, people wanted something new. Um, it started getting at that again, like, this was um, exactly how Grime kind of split from UK Garage. It was like, the drum and bass scene split a little bit when the old like vocal things started coming in and the MCs were starting to get on the mic and that. People were like, oh, it's not how I used to like it. So then Garage came along, people were like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get on this. And then like, <laughs> then that got ruined as well. And then like to them anyway, it got ruined. You know what I mean? It's, um, everyone's always looking for something new. So I think that's why everything evolves. It's just, it's just a continuum. Do you know what I mean? Everything just um, carries on moving. Nice. So what's this record we're going to listen to now? Um, this is an old track. Um, let me just check. I've got the right side of it. Um, 
an old garage track actually. Uh, which is on Locked On. Which this is was on Locked On, which was a which was a big um, garage label. And it kind of spawned out of there was a record shop called Pure Groove. Wasn't that's it? right. That's right. In London, um, they run the label. Mm. And this is an industry standard track. Um, so this sort of this um, basic. Mm -hmm. Well, the speed garage is just a naff, you know, speed journalistic term that Mix Mag magazine came up with, <laughs> sort of thing. It was like a bit of a mad one. I think speed garage is kind of a bit more bass driven than that. That was more, a bit more like house, a bit more uh -huh. US style. Um, speed garage was a bit more bass driven, like the 187 one lockdown and that kind of stuff. There yeah. were a couple of remixes like Armin van Helden did. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like some of his Sneaker stuff. Pimps and all that. That's right, yeah. Now, so, I mean, for you growing up, what was your kind of entry point into, um, into this music and, you know, kind of underground music in general? I, um, I, I, to be honest with you, like living in England, I think England is like every the whole country is brainwashed by like the UK chart. So I didn't actually get into underground music until quite late on. Like probably I was probably about 15 or 16 when I started listening to Jungle, and um, I was into it, but not as into it as a lot of people were and a lot of my friends were. So I was like checking for like, like kind of like like new school break stuff and like when it first sort of, I don't know, like some of the old breakbeat stuff and um, like the sort of stuff people were break dancing into and I was just checking for old stuff and uh, yeah, when we left, when I left secondary school at 16, I suppose I went to college and um, I started listening to Pirates and I was listening to Garage like at about probably the age of 16, which is what, about five or six years ago, like, so not, not that long ago really. Um, I mean, for you, what, what was it initially about Garage that was you know, made you a damn. That's, that's me, I'm feeling it. I just, like, I suppose like at 16, 17, you start thinking about going out and getting drunk and that, and it's like, at the time, that was the music was played in the clubs, and it was like, yeah, you know, I quite like this music. And when, when you've had a few drinks and that, it seems even better, so it's just like you're going out <laughs> with your mates. And, <laughs> and I was just like, yeah, I quite like this stuff. And started buying records and then got into DJing, like, almost straight away, as soon as I started listening to Pirates, I thought, yeah, I quite like this. I mean, if there, was one, if there was one point that, you know, was, was a bit of a catalyst for going, right, you know, I like going out and brocking out to it, but, you're right, I want to be playing them, I want to be making them, what was it for you? Um, it was just the opportunity I had to buy a set of decks off my mate. I just thought, why not? Like, he had them going, they were dirt cheap. I thought, I can't really take up, uh, I've got to take the opportunity up, but I may as well have a go, and if it was cheap, as like, I think I paid, like, a £150 for, like, a full set of decks and turntables and the uh, mixer and everything. And, um, yeah, I just... Uh, I haven't looked back since, really. I just got right into it straight away. And so for you, obviously, the DJing came before the production. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> out of, was it out of necessity that you, the production side of things started to kick off? Um, when I first started, I, t I totally, like, even now, really, I'm not really a musically-minded person. I just sort of know what I like, like, musically. So um, I remember a mate of mine telling me, like, oh, yeah, you'll, you'll start making tracks soon. And I was like, no, nah, I'll never... I'm, I haven't got the, the brain for it. I don't have a clue how to use that equipment. And... And it just got to a point one day I was like DJing, listening to um, Pirate Radio. I'd been on a pirate at the time. I think I might have just left the pirate station at the time. And um, I was listening to a pirate, and and there was a DJ on there um, who was like quite a, who was a quite a big producer at the time, um, but wasn't the greatest DJ. And I just thought, do you know what? Like this is really annoying. I'm a better DJ than this guy, but I'm getting absolutely nowhere. Um, so I thought maybe if I start trying to make some beats and I get lucky, I'll get a set on the radio and that. And uh, yeah, lo and behold, and it, and it, it, it worked. Yeah. <clears throat> well, when you when you talk about pirate radio, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure everyone in this room knows knows about you know a, a bit about pirate radio. Uh, but for for UK music and the evolution of of UK underground music, you know, over the last 15 years, well, 20 years or so, pirate radio has played the pivotal role. I mean, just yeah. just how important you know has pirate radio been for Garage, and what kind of role does it play today still? Um, it's massive. Like there is there's. God knows how many pirate stations in London getting like hit by the DTI like every couple of days, like. But they're 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 still going. Do you know what I mean? I, I I saw a list on the internet actually. Somebody actually took time to go through the dial and say this is a list of all the pirate stations, and there was over a hundred pirate stations like on rotational sort of um, on and off, taking time on and off the airwaves. But um, the station that I'm on, um, Rinse FM, has um, been running for ten years now. And uh, there's like Cool FM still runs, and they've been running from like back in the jungle days as well. Like, it's it's so it's just plays such a big role in um, like bringing forward um, new music. Well, if you go if you go back to like the mid '90s, you know every single pirate in London 
and you know up north it was all jungle all jungle and then when the garage thing came it kind of seemed that all these pirates were now you know it was garage on yeah. pirates everywhere what break down like musically what what you're hearing on pirates these days i i reckon like 90 percent of it is like grime gar garage grime um you, the uh, traditional UK garage is almost gone now, so there's like a couple of stations that will play it all day long and nothing else. And then there's um, other stations that might play a little bit of garage during the day and then like night time is like pure grime. And there's actually now a couple of stations which play 100% like grime, like MCs on every set, kids, everything like mad. Them ones are mad though, they go on and off all the time because the kids like heat up the studio and sooner or later someone finds out where it is and they're having trouble staying on like all the time because there's so many people in the studio all the time. But um, and is, it, is it still a, as bad as it used to be to, to the point with the you know the DTI? You know, if you get busted, like fifty thousand pound fines, you, or your record. I remember a, a guy I used to know played in a pirate and he got all, he had like about fifty thousand records and we ran to his house and confiscated all his records. Is it still that bad? They, they can, still actively. Yeah, they can literally take whatever they want if they find you in a pirate studio. Like at the time when you're broadcasting, they they can take what they want. There's like no law to say they can't walk in your house and take all your records, your decks, anything. Do you know what I mean? And anything on site as well, anything in the building that you're broadcasting from. So it's like. I mean, musically from from that whole scene, uh, you know, the one person that has had amazing international success is Dizzy Rascal. Yeah. Now, with someone like Dizzy Rascal, and there's been a few other names, obviously people like Wiley and all that have sort of crop up over the last year or so. Without Pirate Radio, would you be seeing people like Dizzy? No, definitely not. Like, the, the commercial market in the UK is really, it's so, it's so you're spoon fed it, do you know what I mean? There's, no one will come through unless there's a hype on them. Like, the whole pop idol thing, like these people aren't, do you know what I mean? Half of them aren't good enough to be on television and to be singing. And then, like, they'll get signed by a major record label because they've been on television for the last six yes. months. Do you know what I mean? And they last ten minutes. And then there's, like, actually people like Dizzy trying to come through. If it weren't for, like, the hype that he got on Pirate Radio and playing at raves and stuff, the, um, the majors wouldn't have listened. Like, he could have sent them a million demos and they would have just been like, <coughs> nah, that, what the hell is that? Do you know what I mean? It's too weird. Go, I mean, quick, just quickly going back to the Dizzy thing, I mean, how, uh, how is he perceived within, the, commu within you know, the, the garage community? And... Is, is there a certain element of, you know, Dizzy's done a lot of good for the scene internationally? Yeah, totally. I, I think um, there's, like, some people in the scene are split. There's, like, um, more intellectual people within the scene are, like, really pleased for him. It's good that, uh, to see that he's doing stuff and he's really sort of um, pushing boundaries lyrically and, uh, and in, with, with his sound. And he's totally representing, like, he's, shown, he's opened the door for people like myself to come through and show what I've got to offer. Mm. And, um, but then you've got like the, the more narrow-minded people who are like, uh, they used to go and watch him at the raves and they used to listen to him on Pirate and now like, because you're not going to hear Dizzy on Pirate like every Saturday and he's not like coming and like mashing up all the raves and that, they're yeah, like, oh, he... the local record store. Exactly, it's like, oh, he's, he's selling out and he's not, he's not street anymore, he's not real and it's like, get a grip, man. It's, yeah. Do you, would you, what would you rather be doing? Like sitting in a record shop on a Saturday just chatting to people or... Going like flying out all over the world and playing your records to like playing your music to thousands of people. Like I know what I choose. You mm. know what I mean? Should we play like you know obviously the track you just played, uh, the locked on thing was like a UK garage thing. Should we play another bit now that's kind of you know plots out the course course of evolution? For okay. Music? Yeah. Cool. Um, after UK garage was like, like two step, which was um, which was a uh, slightly and what slightly less dancey, but like a little bit more R&B sort of styles going on and um... And the name Two Step came from just, you know, just the beat? Just like the way the beats were sort of like, yeah, just um... Let's get this track on here. So who, who was that by? Um, this was by a genius crew who actually um, had a... They had a commercial release um, with a track um, not, not long after that, actually. This is like, um, I think this is like 99 sort of time, 99, 2000. And uh, they, had a, they had a release in the charts. Um, um, what was it called? No, no, that was, um, that was, that was more fire crew. Genius oh. crew had the uh, Boom Selection. Right. And uh, they had another track called uh, Course Bruv. Yeah, Course Bruv. Yeah, That's and... Uh, course Bruv. That was it. And um, yeah, like that label, actually, this label, Chronic, um, put out some of the early So Solid stuff before they got signed as well, so it's like... So, 
it's quite a big two-step label. Like. Musically, with, with two-step, what we, we're kind of dealing with the same kind of like, you know, bass hits and vocal edits. Yeah. It's the full, the full stuff you're playing before, but now we've just the, the beat pattern had changed. The beat pattern had changed. It was just skippy beats and more. The bass was, I suppose, a little bit more punchy, whereas like the the four-four bass was a bit more subby, a bit more rolling, and mm. like this was a bit more punchy and a bit more in your face. Like. So in terms of that four to the floor sound, you mm. know, like people like Todd Edwards and all that, is anyone still actually doing that in London? There's a few, there's a few people. That's like, it's like music, it's never gonna, ne music's never gonna die totally, do you know what I mean? There's always someone in the world who's gonna be doing something. It's never gonna totally fade away. So um, there's a few guys, there's about f a handful, literally a handful of producers like Matt Qualified, um, MJ Cole's still doing UK Garage, um, uh, Carl Brown is producing stuff with LB um, under the L, t L Tough. There's so a few. Carl Tough enough. Yeah, Carl Tough enough. Brown and um, LB like, uh, are producing under a list of L Tough. They produce like quite soulful, four to the floor garage stuff. But it's, but essentially, uh, garage scene as as we have known it is is pretty yeah, non existent. Yeah, it's pretty much non existent. I think it was like when the first couple of grime tunes came around. It was like all the kids loved it, and it was like all of the old garage people were like, we don't. We don't like this, and a lot of the people involved with Garage at the time were like, "I'm, I'm, not, I'm nothing to do with this grime. I don't like this stuff. I'm, I've had enough of Garage now. If that's the way it's going." So then, half of them people went on to like doing Funky House, and then like you've got the other half of people who were like, "The girl, like the when the girls left, a lot of the sort of like Friday night drinking crew went out to Croydon and got mashed up and went and did, raved up to some Garage." When the girls leave the scene, they left it as well. So it was like they went on, moved on to listening to some R and B. Yeah. They're again getting brainwashed by what was being played on Radio One and Kiss FM and stuff like that in London. And um, uh, yeah, it is, it's just like the UK way of um, being brainwashed by what's play, getting played on commercial radio. Right. I mean, the <clears throat> one of the things that was kind of like you know there was this, this symbiosis with the garage scene was the screw face element, there mm. was that bad vibe. It got a bit too A few blue. stabbings at Iron yeah. here and there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, when did that element kind of, because that, that element really did give the music a bad name, didn't it? Yeah, it was when it got commercial and it was like cool to go out and rave to garage. It was like a, such a bling. It was like the UK's like hip hop scene, basically. It was like how you can go out and sort of buy champagne and go out with all your gold on and that. And it was like, God, it got a bit boring, do you know what I mean? And that's when, Going out became like you sort of like had to watch what you were doing. You would be looking around, saying, thinking like, "Am I going to be all right in this club?" Sort of thing. It got really moody, and that's like about the same time as the girls started leaving because it was like the girls didn't don't like seeing fights and stuff like that. It's like not happening, man. And that's when it started to go downhill. Now you're talking about before, uh, you know, one of the first grime tunes that came out that was properly labelled grime is a track called Pulse X. Yeah, you yeah. You got that here? Yeah, yeah, I've got that. And what, what year did this kind of come out? And this came out, I think, 2001, 2002. About then, yeah. I reckon probably 2001, like, I think it was a... I, mean, I still remember the first time I heard it. It was a Big Apple Christmas party. I think that was... And Big Apple was a record shop? Big Apple's a record shop in Croydon. Um, we specialise in garage and... Uh, two, from two step to four to the floor garage, it's always been like one of the main stockists in like London, definitely in South London, the main one. And uh, I remember I was, they had a Christmas party and they had like Heartless Crew booked there, and um, Oris J and Hatcher played there. Um, and at the time it was still quite garagey. It was starting to get a little bit dark and a little bit experimental. But this track, even even when it started to get experimental, was just so different. It was just like, what what is it? Do you know what I mean? It's just a mad track. It's totally different to anything that was being played at the time. And were you producing at this stage? Um, at this stage, I, I, was, I was dabbling in production. I just sort of got fruity loops off the internet and was messing about with it, trying to, trying to fit beats that were terrible, but still, like, you've got to start somewhere, do you know what I mean? So you'd say without a doubt, this, this tune was one of the tunes that made you go, oi, damn, that's, that's kind of the direction yeah, I want to. Yeah, and I think it, it is like, this kick-started the grime scene, because it's such a simple track, there was like, Thousands of kids in London like I really love that tune, but listen how simple it is. I'm gonna get I'm gonna make a tune like that And there was like a period of about six months where you were just hearing like Some poor poor tracks man and like I was probably one of the culprits as well <laughs> making. So I was like listen to this tune and it's terrible like but um At least you can admit it to yourself And they're like it was the, the whole thing of it was someone's made a track and everyone would be like mate That's rubbish and they'd be like yeah, but it's it's as good as that or like it sounds like that and it's like oh come on man just Give it a rest, give it a few months and you'll be alright. But uh, yeah, this is uh, Pulse X, this is sort of what kick-started it all.
being bandied about, which was 8 bar. This is it. This, when this track came out, like, because at the time, obviously, there was no such thing as grime, everyone was like, what is that? Do you know what I mean? That's, like, all the garage people were like, that's rubbish, that's, we don't like that. And then there's, like, all the kids and, like, people like me who were just, like, starting to get into what was getting a bit darker in garage, and that came along, and it was like, wow, that's a pretty cool tune. I, I, I really liked it, and uh, everyone called it 8 bar because it just, like, changed every 8 bars. It was just, like, people... That, it, that even kind of became a little genre for about six months and then it turned into grime when it got a little bit more like, you can't have every tune that just changes every eight bars. That's bit, <laughs> you know, every tune sort of thing, yeah. like what's going on. Now, I mean, the one thing that people will first notice when they, when they look at you, 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 you're not an old fella at all, are you? No, it's... You're, 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 a, wee, you're a wee man, you're 22 years old. Which, that's right. But the thing well, is, funnily enough, for that scene, you're pretty old. Yeah, totally. Like, the kids, it is a, it is a young, young scene, it's like... Tell us how young, because I mean, you were playing me a tune before that you were about to sign from someone who's 14 years old. That's right, yeah, it's a kid like from uh, Milton Keynes in England. It's like a whole young like crew of kids, and uh, there's even and now. Dave, Dave's old stomping ground. Yeah, Milton man. Keynes. Milton Keynes, and uh, it's just like there are now, like, we have like the, the, the grime crews like Roll Deep and Nasty Crew and Boys in the Hood and that, and like now. It's got to the point where, right, there's these kids that are coming through and they all have like, it's like a B team, it's like the younger kids, like the youth team, they've got like, they call them like younger nasty and roll deep youngers and the, the wild out ones. And they're like, kids are like 12, 13 years old, getting on the mic, MC and going on pirate radio, DJ. And, and it was even, the first ones to do it actually, funny enough, were so solid crew. And they had a little, like um, one of the DJ's younger brothers, um, Skip and Frost. And like they were eight years old, and they used to go on delight when like so solid one pirate radio at eight years old. Like they have about twelve now, like quite good DJs as well. Like but twelve years old, and like they're playing grime, and there's just loads of kids, man. There's a station called Raw Blaze, and I know like half the people on it are like under sixteen. It's just, like <laughs> have to take like bunk school to go and like do a set, like telling their texting all their mates in school like listen to me on the radio. They're all like sneaking out of lessons on their mobile phones listening and that mad but it is such a young scene it's like it, it's good though because if you've got if you've got youth do you know what i mean it's got longevity and uh, yeah. it's definitely there's definitely a big future for it now that, i mean the one thing that you kind of touched on before that was, was <clears throat> it's a pretty funny thing you know you've got this old school of guys like the dream team mm. norris boss windross and all these boys who you know they were there when speed garage broke and they got their radio one shows and they'll mc creed and they were all you know they were they were living the life they get their yeah, column inches in all the magazines they were feeling like stars and all of a sudden it seems like they felt their whole scene was robbed from a whole bunch of 14 yeah, and 15 year olds. It was, it was like we were saying the other day. Like, now tell us about this committee thing then. Cause they, <laughs> they got together, like when stuff like this started coming through like in the whole garage scene, like a lot of the old guys got together and they was like, we can't, like the Dream Team and like, Creed and a few other guys got together and it was like, we can't have this music. This is like totally ruining our scene, our beautiful scene. And uh, they got together and actually had a meeting and set up what they called the UK Garage Committee. And, and uh, actually started saying, like, we refuse to play this on our radio show on Radio 1. And, like, the DJs who were playing, like, on legal radio all started, we're not, we're not going to support this. This is rubbish. Like, this isn't, this isn't us at all. And uh, lo and behold, a few months later, they've all lost their shows. Like, nobody wants to listen to what they're playing anymore because people were waiting so long for a change in the garage. And um, it came, finally. And, like, everyone liked, a lot of people liked it. And everyone who didn't liked it didn't like it, just moved on to something else like R&B or Funky House and really the only people left in Garage now are like the DJs who, there's not really, there's not really a sort of punt, there's no sort of punters who are just going to check it out and like go, still go out raving to it, the few people that go out raving and there's like a scene of DJs, it's really close knit now and it's, this UK Garage committee totally flopped man, they all used to like make a living out of DJ Garage and that, yeah. <laughs> The bread's not on the table as much as it was. No, totally. Now, I mean, one of the, the, the beauties, it seems, with the whole grime scene, and you, as you're saying, you know, you've got all these young kids who... It seems that, like, Fruity Loops is a programme, you know, you, you're dealing with a whole lot of people that maybe they come from the, the projects of the ends, and they don't have a lot of money, they can go and get a crap version of Fruity Loops and then be making beats. Yeah, um, that was it. The mic the when this track came along, it was just like... Uh, the kids just hearing it, and they were... Brief intermission. They were just like, I can do that. And uh, they all downloaded like Fruity Loops or even like 
music generator on the PlayStation and stuff like that. It was just like kids, whatever you could get hold of. Young kids were just getting it and they were having a go doing, doing beats like that, basically. And there was a good like six months of a whole, a whole genre of stuff like that. And people were, half of the scene was getting annoyed with it and half the scene was trying to get involved with it. And then it sort of, it was like a cleansing period, I think. It was like that anyone who was trying then, like most of the people who were getting somewhere out of it then, of, um, are still here today, sort of like doing track taste, but on a, a more, more advanced um, sounds. Perhaps not just not perhaps um, equipment that they with in terms of equipment what they're using, but uh, they're still using the same sort of equipment, but they're just using it more like properly, and they're using it better, and they're getting better sounds out of it. But for you, I mean, when you started Fruity Loops, and still to this day, Fruity Loops. Yeah. You haven't. I've um, I've used a Cubase and Reason. Um, at college, I'm doing. I'm actually. At, I'm currently at college studying a music technology diploma. Um, I went to college when I started. Well, like about. I'd had about seven releases, and then I just thought like, it's going really well, and I'd kind of like to try and make a career of it. So I thought I want to get. A, I want to go to college and actually learn something musical and, like, get a bit of a like a a bit of paper that says yeah you can actually do some music. Like, nice. So yeah, I'm at college now, and um, something to show mum. Yeah, that's it, man. Keep her happy. Keep yeah. her quiet. Now, I mean, we'll, we'll go another track. There's a, a remix, I'm sure, like a lot of people in this room, uh, familiar with Alter Ego. Uh, they've done a track called Rocker that was originally on Clang, part of the Playhouse family, and it's kind of crossover. They just got signed to um, Skint, and you've done a remix of that. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to try and find that for you, actually. It's in here somewhere. Um, yeah, it's a guy called Andy. He got in contact with John at Big Apple Records in Croydon. Um, and he was just like really interested in what I was doing and got in contact with me and said, do you want to have a go at doing a remix for us? And uh, of course I didn't turn it down. I thought Skint's a really well-respected label like worldwide. So it's just cool that it's good to know that these people are starting to find out what, what you're doing. Do you know what I mean? It's really good um, when you hear like that, that these uh, people are um, like, it just goes to show like how quickly it's all spreading sort of thing at the moment. Uh, I think this is the track here. Yeah. yeah, this is the track here. This is a remix I've just done for Alter Ego. <laughs> okay, so is, is grime, is it kind of some set beat pattern that it follows? No, or? no, not at all. It's um, just, uh, it's just like, so well, long as you've got like, yeah, just uh, energy and like a nice fat, like it's not, the bass is normally like, quite fat and uh, warm as compared with some other like um, genres of electronic dance music um, it's just like quite a fat sound some of the um, some of the stuff that MCs like are made for MCs sounds a bit more hip hop oriented like with like um, string patterns and stuff like that there's like loads of different sounds going off in grime it's all it's all sort of like based around about 140 bpm though so any there's no like strip beat patterns so long as it's as long as it's moving, basically. Yeah. Now you also you hooked up with Reflex. You got signed to Reflex. Yes. Yeah. Um, how'd that come about, man? Um, that's, that's a pretty cool thing. Yeah. The, the track that I played at the beginning, Hard Graft, uh, came out, and um, a few of the like electronic uh, electronica shops in uh, like London picked up on it. They were like, "This is quite interesting. I might be able to shift some of these." And um, Grant, who um, helps run the label with uh, Richard D. James, uh, picked the record up, and he really liked it. And he came and um, I played a gig in a. Uh, London at a night called Forward, which kind of like is a is a night which sort of supports the kind of music that we're playing. It's like a whole night of it. At, um, plastic people in London, and Grant came down and checked it out, and I played a set there, and he really enjoyed it. And he got in contact with the guy who put the night on to get some beats off of me, and yeah, he was really into it. And he picked up four tracks he really liked, picked another couple of artists, and he did the same with them. They all had we had like four tracks each on this uh, triple pack LP. Which and, was yeah, called. It was called Grime. Yeah. yeah. And now uh, Grime 2 is uh, coming soon, I believe. That's right. right. Um, Grime 2 is due for release next month, I believe. And that's, um, technically, it's not Grime. Right. Technically, it's another genre called... It's another genre <laughs> called... Called Dubstep, oh. which is like... You could, you garage, know. just... Do you know what I mean? It's the continuum never ends. Well, yeah, yeah, that's it. Gay what rage. You call it? Garage. Um, <laughs> now, I mean, yeah, you, you've dropped the name, so we better get an example. Dubstep's another name that's been kind of creeping into to, you know, the subconscious recently. Uh, people like Horsepower Productions and all that. Define uh, Dubstep, and, and can you give us a bit of an example as well? Well, I'll just pick this one up. This is, um, there's a label, um, Big Apple Records actually own a label, um, and a lot of the stuff they put out is um, 
dubstep. There's a few guys like Horsepower Productions, stuff with a label called Tempo. I don't know if anyone's heard of it. Um, it's quite, it takes like, influences from like um, old dub reggae, but it sort of like fuses it with two step beats and stuff like that. It's, some of it's quite like, quite ethnic, like bongos and stuff like that. There's loads of different examples. I'll try and get a. And so you, as a, as a grime DJ per se, I mean, you go out and you play a lot of dubstep. I, um, I drop the odd bit of dubstep, but there are, to be honest with you, I leave, there's like, a D, like Hatcher's probably like the dubstep DJ and another guy called Youngster at um, Rinse FM. And uh, them guys properly are like pure dubstep. So I leave them to play all of the big tracks and that. I just drop, pick out a couple that I like and might drop them. Um, this is a track um, which came out on Big Apple Recordings. Um, by screen and well, it's just like get to the end of that track. Um, this is a track called uh, Skunk Step by Scream, which is pretty not, not another new genre. Uh, this is a uh, yeah, no, 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 yeah, so that's dubstep, which is kind of like similar, it fits in nicely with what we're playing, like in the whole grime thing, but it's technically, do you know what I mean? It's if you want to get deep, it's not really in anything like it at the same time. There's like another artist called Code Nine who is pure dub. Like some of his tracks don't even have beats and stuff like that. It's pretty deep. And like he plays it forward and stuff like that. It all just kind of, it all just sort of merges in somehow. People are just uh, picking up on whatever they can, sort of thing, playing whatever. Now, this night forward you're talking about, I mean, <clears throat> historically, any kind of new uh, music that kind of emerges has its epicentre, be it, you know, Paradise Garage or The Warehouse or yeah. Breakbeat Hardcore had Rage at Heaven, Jungle had AWOL, Bugs in the Attic got, I mean, sorry, Broken Beats got Co-op. Is Forward kind of like the epicentre for grime? It's, um, Forward is, it's a weird, it's hard because a lot of people in England even are getting confused, like they're calling like, the like more technical grime, they're calling it Forward Beats and stuff. People are getting confused because it's like, Forward is more of a music based night, whereas like more of the grime nights are for like, more MC based stuff and like lyrical clashes and stuff like that. And then, um, yeah, like Forward's more of like a night to do more with the music. So it's like, you can come and play the same tracks that they're playing at these MC nights, like Eskimo dance and stuff like that. But um, at Forward, it's more to do with the music. So it's like, you can drop the same tracks, it doesn't matter, but more people are there to listen to the beats and dance to it. Yeah, now I mean, when you, when you talk about the whole clashing thing, I mean, that's something that, especially with grime, is, is kind of risen up and, you know, shooting along at the same speed. Is this whole warring thing, and it's, it, I don't know, it kind of seems really self-defeating, it's just... It's mad, yeah. Well, what's the whole deal with the warring thing? It's like, I'm gonna clash you, yep. What? Yeah, it's, it's really mad. There's like DVDs coming out now of like, <laughs> studio, studio time, like, fights on the mic and stuff like that, but it's mainly staged, like the MCs sort of sort out between themselves, like, right, me and you, we're gonna get up on the mic, start cussing his, each other's mums and that, get off the mic and then shake hands sort of thing. But on the DVD, it's like they're all in their face telling them they're gonna beat them up and that, and it's mad, like, it's like the MC, it's just like, it's, I don't know, it's really weird, it's kind of like hip-hop, but a bit more aggressive and, a bit, yeah, a bit more blatant. And the, the problem is a lot of people don't, you know, a lot of young people watching, the, looking up to these guys as kind of somewhat idols, they mm. don't realise that it's all for show, and a lot of people take it seriously, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure the kids definitely, a lot of the kids don't know that it's fake. It's like watching wrestling, like when the kids are young, they think that wrestling's real, and then they find WWF. out. WWF. That's it, yeah, it's like, <laughs> grime is the same, it's like this whole, like, MC culture, the MCs go and they, like, stage a show, like, we're gonna go and get everyone excited by starting telling everyone that like your mum slept with him or something like that and uh, it's, it's just mad but um <coughs> I mean yeah. the other thing you were talking about as well that's, that's kind of mad is you know at any kind of musical event a big tune is a big tune purely on the fact that it sounds good it's got a wicked bass on or whatever but you might have a, bit, a tune that's a pretty average tune but it might be big at say one of these uh, lyrical nights totally. because someone Chats a certain lyric or something. My first ever release was um, signed purely on the basis that uh, MC got on the mic on um, one of uh, DJ Slimzy's sets on Rinse FM years ago. Who's Slimzy? Um, Slimzy's like one of, at the time, he still is like the biggest sort of DJ in the like darker side of garage and grime. And like he was the one who sort of brought grime through at the like more commercial garage nights. He would go there, get booked, and he'd play like a set full of dub plates. And um, yeah, and like I gave him a track, and this was before I had anything released. And um, he, he cut it onto a dub plate, and he asked if he could have it exclusive. I said, Yeah, you can keep it for a while. And um, yeah, he had an MC called Rico on his set, and Rico got on the mic just as the tune started coming in. 
and he starts cussing this guy from uh, another crew called Morfire Crew. And this was like, this is quite early in the whole clashing thing. It was quite unusual to hear it on the radio. So when you hear something like that, there was such an excitement and there was a big like talk about on the internet, loads of kids going on there, who heard this, who heard what he said about Nico from Morfire Crew. And my, I happened to be my track he was like spitting over at the time. And uh, yeah, the kids were like, what was that tune that was playing when he was spitting? That was a big tune. And so purely on the fact yeah. that he was dissing someone else. Totally, like, if he'd, if he'd have gone home, like, and then, like, the kids had all sort of, oh, turned their radio off, I probably never would have got the track signed right. in the first place. Like, it's mad. Now, another thing you're talking about with dub plate culture, obviously, especially very much a, a, a UK thing with, <clears throat> with jungle and with garages, you know, DJs were playing pure plates. And if you were, you know, if you were a DJ that was carrying weight, you had to be drawing pure dubs. Oh, yeah. I mean, with the advent of these things, how has dub plate culture been affected? Um, in grime, not so much because it's such a young scene. Like I was saying, um, there's like, there's not many DJs who can use them. It's like, it's, it's such it's such a funny scene. It's such like a young scene, and the, the young kids nowadays are just like lazy. They just see this, they like that, and then they see that, and they're like, <laughs> what? It doesn't move around, so they're just like confused. I'm not touching that. I'm just gonna stick to this. So they're going, they're spending or say, spending all their pocket money saving up for like. 30 pounds for a dub plate and they're cutting like on a 10 inch rep dub plate which is supposed to hold like one track per side they're like cutting three tunes of about <laughs> one minute long on each side it's like coming up the quality is like rubbish and they're going home like well happy they've got like a bag full of dubs but like each one's about a minute long and they're all really poor quality i mean for you yourself are you playing much dub plate um, 50 50 kind of yeah like i don't really cut much anymore but uh i cut occasionally it depends like if i've got a track that i know might never come out and uh I want to play it in the club. Like, there's a new, there's actually a new cutting studio in Bristol in England that cuts dubs onto PVC, so it's like no metal at all, and they weigh less than a record. I've got one here. Yeah, you don't have to pay 35 quid for a. It cost about 35 pounds, but it's, it's, it's like plastic. It's not got an acetate inside it, so like a normal dub plate. You miss out on that dub plate smell, though. Yeah, but it still smells nice. <laughs> it's like have a smell. <laughs> Everyone can have a go later <laughs> on. Yeah, we'll pass, pass it, it around. around. Don't scratch it, though. It's a quite <laughs> a good track. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, should we, go, should we go on another track quickly, and then I think you're going to give us a little bit of a, a Fruity Loop session. Yeah, well, um, I, I just get, a, get this uh, Wiley track on just to show that the MC inside of the, yeah. the grime thing. And so also, it would be cool to, uh, you've just done a remix for High Contrast, drum bass producer as well. Yeah, yeah, I've just, uh, just finished it now, but like the version I've got is the uncomplete finished, but yeah, we've got enough of it to, to show a good, uh, cool. let's um, get this track on here and yeah. This is uh, Wiley, who's just been signed to XL. Uh, this is a track called um, Ch Take Chances, I believe. It'll take me a few guys to figure out the lyrics. But yeah, yeah, no, it's, um, yeah, it's, but like, he's basically, that, the, whole, the whole tune is just like war, pure war, just like, don't come and step to me with your attitude because you'll get beaten up, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's part of the success of the, the MC League grime and even, you know, Prior before that, you know, with the UK Garage thing, is it, as soon as you add an MC into the mix, it's like with the, the comparisons with hip hop, blah blah yeah, blah. Yeah. Is it the first time where you know UK and especially the youth they felt like this is this is our own, this yeah, is our totally. own music. Yeah, it's like we were having a chat um, back home about it not long ago. It's just like a lot of um, UK acts who are doing stuff like this are making the mistake of then like putting an album together and putting hip hop on it because I think like the reason Dizzy has done so well is because he's come with something that nobody's heard before. And like people all over the world are like, this is amazing. Like, what is this stuff? And uh, there's so much of it that people wouldn't even believe. Like, if you came to London and just went in the record shop and saw the amount of like different kinds of grime there are and different MCs and how many artists are involved, it's just mad. Like, and white label culture is rife. Like, people just purely press up, say, two fifty. It's getting yeah, white. it's getting better. I mean, this is a this is a release that came out recently. Like, this is a pure grime release as well. Like, there's a it was a big track, big like rhythm for the MCs and stuff like that. It's got like a full, like, eight artwork sleeve, and like, for me, like that is like one of the first ever grime tracks to have a full colour sleeve, and it's just mad. Like, they've even gone to the extent of getting labels done. It's not. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know what you're saying before, someone like Dizzy's kind of taken it to the world, and you know, with anyone in kind of UK garage, you know, all your dream teams and all that. Sure, they were the biggest thing in the UK, but no mm. one knew, That's it, and yeah. they never played outside of the UK, but with yeah. Grime, are you starting, to, you're starting to play outside of England? Yeah, I've, um, I mean, last weekend I played Brussels um, to 2,000 people at a, 
a big um, event there called the White Night, which is like an all-night event that goes on all over the city. They have different nights. I mean, I played Amsterdam a few weeks before that, and Austria the week before that, and you toured the States. Toured the States. Todd. Todd, yeah, he, he was here the other day. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just like I think the reflex thing has totally opened doors as well. And like, like for me personally, but like Dizzy's sort of paved the way for the rest of us to follow in his footsteps. And I, I, I got to ask, with the name, have you had any angry, angry techno orphans oh, on your door? Um, it's quite funny actually. No uh, call from Richie Horden? No, funny enough, no. But um, apparently he does know about me, but nothing's been done. I mean, uh, John Peel, he's got a show on Radio 1 in the UK. Uh, plays quite a lot of my stuff. He's a, good, he's a big supporter of what I'm doing. And uh, every, tra every time he plays one of my tracks, he always says Plastic Man with the C. And it's like now... When I meet someone, they'll be like, oh, you're Plastic Man with the C. And I'm like, yeah, like, it's part of my name or something like that. But, uh, yeah, nothing really has come back. I mean, if anything, people have been like, yeah, I think that's cool that you did that sort of thing. They've been like, yeah, like, it's it just sort of, it's sort of like the whole grime, like, we don't, give, we don't give a shit what you're doing, like, this is us sort of thing. Like, it's the whole grime attitude. It's almost like I did it on purpose, but I didn't. I honestly hadn't heard of Richie Horton when I started, and... I think I'd had about three releases before I'd even heard of him, and then I had like a second, another release <laughs> after that before I heard any of his tracks. And yes, it was something you said. Is that very much, uh, you know, within that whole grime scene? It's like a lot of other musical genres. You know, people are taking influences from here, there, and everywhere. Yeah. But grime producers, they're just feeling grime. We've pure got the blinkers on, man. We don't have a clue what is going on in the world outside. What we're doing is why it sounds a bit weird compared to most stuff that's going on, because most of the stuff is like. Like, oh, I might hear that track and think, I like that track, I'm going to do one similar to that. And I don't sit there and sort of listen to techno and that and think, I'm going to use those mad sounds in a grime tune. But, um, like, the whole reflex thing and, like, getting this remix work from labels like um, Skin and Low Recordings and, um, it, like, the tunes that they've given me to remix, I'm sort of sitting there thinking, these tracks are actually quite interesting. It's just, like, something I can bring into my sound. And, yeah, it's good, like, the whole... The way that more people are getting involved with it is just bringing my music forward as well. It's really cool. Shall we uh, go on to one more track before we go on to that? Yes, we, it's, um, this is the, it should be anyway, the remix that I've, uh, I'm currently working on for High Contrast. It's just finished now, but this is an unfinished version that you're going to hear. But yeah. <laughs> Interesting working with vocals the first time. Um, yeah, I mean, like, to be honest with you, I had tried once before with an a cappella and, um, of a guy who I know emceed, and, uh, like, it's, like, for me, at the moment, it's still what I'm actually learning as well, like, to actually master, um, sorry, to record and master vocals myself. Um, I don't have the equipment at home to do it, so I'm purely sort of just doing it at college to get a feel for it. But if someone can give me a decent a cappella, like, with, which has already been mastered, like, with ad-libs and stuff, I can... I can like, run away with it. Like that track there was originally like 174 BPM. I had to time stretch the vocals down to like 143, I think I produced that track at. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a long process, but it was quite enjoyable just getting involved with doing vocals and like running them into Fruity Loops and time stretching them and like cutting them into little bits so they fit. Because Fruity Loops doesn't, you can't, it's not like Cubase, you can just drag it and time stretch it. It's, you actually have to cut it to pieces and start putting it here, there, and everywhere on the drum, on the drum machine kind of thing. Now, with your setup at home, what are you running? Obviously, as you say, you've been using Fruity Loops, but what about for sampling and um, sampling? Like, I just use like Cool Edit or like um, SoundForge, and uh, I just download samples off the internet. I just search hard for them. Like, I'll go, like, I might hear a track on the radio and think that's like clean. I'm going to go and buy a CD, cut like something, new, distort it out a bit, and yeah, it's just like you can get samples from everywhere. Sample CDs, even that like I buy samples and get them off of friends and stuff. It's just like building up a good library. If you're going to use Fruity Loops, it's really important that you get a good library of samples because the stuff that they give you when you're first there, unless you're going to like, unless you're like amazing with synths and stuff like that on software, you're going to find it difficult to get out, come with a nice sound. Like the drum kits and that in there are pretty like old school, like the 808 kit is about all you get, sort of thing. A few samples on top of that. And what about plugins? You're, you're mad on plugins? Yeah, like, to be honest, like, that's, and again, like, something that I've only recently come into play. Like, I was purely samples. Like, every track was just, like, waves. I was just using, like, wave bass lines, wave drum kits, wave, like, instrument hits, and 
messing about with them and playing them in different keys and putting them through effects units and that to make them sound like something else and that. But, um, yeah, like since going to college, like last year, starting last year at college, um, I've sort of like learned how to use VSTs and I've sort of like got m loads at home now using just whatever I can get my hands on, I'll just have a go on it and I'm, I'm just starting to pick things up now sort of thing. It's like a, I don't know, it's just a learning curve. Just, I'm just probably still <coughs> like, I'm sure there's people in here, that, there are definitely people in here who've like got much wider knowledge of software based simps and like, I've, I've never used a hardware simp in my life, like ever. I used to, I like the, the TS-404 in the old version, it's really like manageable, you can just turn it into all sorts of sounds. Uh. Just quickly, does anyone in this room use Free Loops or has used it? Yeah, it's, um, it's more, more or less a drum machine, do you know what I mean? But you can put all sorts of things in it and uh, you can get some good stuff out of it. I mean, like, I've just been messing about with a, a loop, getting like, a loop together. Um, let's just mute a few of these channels. Um, but yeah, just a So that's like a four bar tune as opposed to an eight bar sort of a... Uh, but that was like how eight bar tracks were being made, basically. Someone was coming with like two eight bar loops and just pacing it through the entire track. And that's kind of what kick started the whole grime thing, really. Um, I'm just going to play this, this Wiley track, actually, to sort of emphasise what I was saying about the whole square bass thing and the slide. This was, um, this was um, one of Wiley, this was Wiley's first sort of like instrumental release um, with this kind of sound. This is like what he calls Esky Beat, which is kind of like his version of grime. It's the same, it's technically grime, but he's just uh, wanted to name it. But this was like a massive track. It sold about, I don't know, it still sells today. So that was like Wiley's like take on grime and that sort of like whole square bass sound was what, like that was like the biggest track at the time. It was like quite soon after Pulse X, it wasn't far after like the first, well it was one of the first few grime tracks to come about and like that was big. And uh, yeah, he sort of like started his own version of grime, what he called a uh, Esky Beat. And uh, he's, I've, I've got a track here actually, which is a new one from him. But, and like, it's just to show that people do still make eight bar tracks, even now. This is um, a track by Wiley. Um. Quite clever, lot like we were saying about um, how a track can get big from like MCs saying certain lyrics over the top of it. Wiley always makes the tunes, and like like that track, I don't know if you've heard it, that track, What You Call It, yeah. that was in the charts and that. Um, that tune got big because uh, he staged a clash and made the tune, and he made all the MCs involved in this big clash like do a version of it. And like they all like, well, every time you heard a clash on the radio, it was over his tune. Right. So all the kids were like, oh, that tune that they're always um, killing each other over. And like, yeah, it got massive. And this is the same. This track here he made for, um, he made for uh, originally for um, the Morfire Youngers, like the kids Morfire crew. And uh, it got quite big. And then like he went onto one extra on the UK Garage weekend and brought like, um, he had like a Wiley showcase and he brought loads of MCs from East London down and basically got this tune on and he made everyone just gun each other on the mic and it's just like quite a big tune now. And uh, yeah, it's like kids, like things like this as well, like there's like a massive sort of bootleg culture in the whole grime scene where um, at the moment um, there's, a, there's a thing on the internet called DC++ where you can put files on and download them and that. Kids are getting hold of tunes like this on CD. This is unreleased at the moment. Um, they're getting hold of these on CD, like burning them as MP3s onto their computer, and then they're putting them up on DC++ going, yeah, download them. So you all listen. Like, I, it happened to me with this track um, that I, that's only just come out. I heard a remix of this track before I'd even released it, like, because kids were downloading it and doing and cut up bootleg versions of it. Is that, I mean, is that worrying you as a label head? Just yeah. It kind of seemed, is it, the grime scene, it's, it's rife throughout it with the whole bootleg thing? Yeah, it's... Uh, People, like, this is the whole dub plate culture, like, people want an exclusive version of a track. And if they can't get it, they sit at home, cut it up and make one. Yeah. They don't care what the producer thinks, like... I've heard, I've heard, like, bootlegs of my tracks all over the place, and, like, people even have the cheek to send me them on... I'll be on an MSN Messenger, a little kid will come up, like, what's up, blood? And here's this, <laughs> like, tune, have a listen of it, and it's, like, got all my samples all over it, and I'm like, mate, are you joking? Like, <laughs> what's going on there? Like, are you going to release this? And he's like... No, blood, it's, it's, just a, it's just a dub plate. And... <laughs> but then I find out, like, someone else has got it going, yeah, I cut that tune that their kid sent me, and there's, like, a million, like, people playing 
this bootleg version of my tune that like I haven't authorized and stuff. I mean, for you, what's what's coming up next? You got like your own label. And... Yeah, um, I've got releases on my label. I've got about six releases lined up on the label over the next like I try and get trying to get one out each month. And the um, label is called. For it's called a uh, terror rhythm. Um, it's just like an independent label. I'm sort of signing this purely grime stuff, like I'm doing in a just all sorts. Like I've put out a release from my, Mark One and myself called Fight, and then um, this one is like a three track EP by by me um, with a track on it called Char, which was quite big. And uh, yeah, the next one's another one from me, and then after that, I've got that track by the young kids from um, Milton Keynes, and I've got a remix um, of one of my tracks that was on the Grime album, um, done by a crew from um, Bedford called uh, Maccabi Unit. So yeah, it's got the label. Well, like, bookings are really taking off at the moment as well, like with the whole Grime thing, like internationally they're starting to come in now as well so and are any DJs outside of the grime scene like say for example in America who play more ecliptic mixes are you finding out that they're, they're playing grime and yeah like and you're finding producers popping up what you were saying before there's some, some guys in Australia that have sent you tunes yeah like it, people are just starting like it's starting to take off now like I went to a, I went to a, there was a I played at a, a night in London called a rebel bass which was at electro works in London um, and a, it was a good night, so like I went there a couple of weeks later. There was another night, like same night, but they had more electro DJs on. And uh, I went there and I was like walking around, and like there was electro DJs in like room two playing like char and stuff. I was like, no way, like. <laughs> and um, the guy who was here from DJ Magazine in the week, like he um, he's he's a he's a producer on a, a label called Low, which is like an electronic label, and like he knew my stuff and he knew who I was when he got here, and so yeah, people are in like other genres are, are starting to stand up and take note, which is like the difference between grime and the whole UK garage thing. It was like they didn't really want to know. Cool. Chris, thank you very much. Thank you.